Today's reading is from Psalm 95, and I want to just share quickly, the translation that I'll be using comes from this book, Psalms Anew. It is an inclusive translation, meaning that God is not referred to as either male or female. And another change that they make, instead of referring to God as Lord, they use Yahweh. Because for many of us, Lord has masculine connotations. We have Lord and Lady, as well as Lord has not always been a very pleasant term. I'm going to lord that over you. And the lords in our histories have not always treated their subjects very well. So anyway, a brief introduction to Psalm 95 verses 1 through 7. Come, let us sing joyfully to God. Let us acclaim the rock of our salvation. Let us greet God with thanksgiving. Let us joyfully sing psalms. For Yahweh is a great God above all gods. God cradles the depths of the earth and holds fast the mountain peaks. God shaped the sea and owns it and formed the dry land by hand. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the God who made us. For Yahweh is our God, and we are the people God shepherds, the flock God leads. Oh, that today you would hear God's voice. Well, today is week one in our sermon series on Adam Hamilton's book called The Walk. Uh, Now, you don't need to have a copy of this book to participate in our sermon series for Lent. Um, If you do get a copy, though, it will help you along. There are parts of my sermon which are going to lend itself to to what Hamilton is saying in the book, and it will just be uh, generally helpful. If you are interested in learning more details about how to order um, the walk, or want to know where to order it from, you can give me a call or email me in the church office, and I'd be happy to, to share those details with you. Um, in his book, Hamilton offers up five essential practices for Christian discipleship or for the spiritual life. And these are rooted in our own Wesleyan Christian tradition. And, these, and if they're done intentionally, they can help you... Um, get closer in your relationship to God. Each Sunday of Lent, we are going to focus on one of these practices, and then when we get to Holy Week, we're going to put them all together. Today, Hamilton lifts up the fundamental practices of of worship and worship's sibling practice, which is prayer. He reminds us that a robust worship and prayer life are essential to growing and maturing in the Christian faith. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, I've been in worship, both in the NPR and even in our other sanctuary. I've sat through worship, but I'm not quite sure what it is or, or how to define it. And uh, as I asked myself this question, how I would define worship as I was reading this book, the first word that came to my mind was response. And Hamilton actually expands on this a little bit by defining worship as primary as the primary and appropriate response of the creature to the creator i want you to take note of that worship is the primary and appropriate response of the creature to the creator as many of you know sydney is now three and quickly moving into four years old she is talking now a mile a minute and she's into everything and keeping us in great shape because we're trying to just keep up with her Um, all over the place, whether she's outside playing or or in the house. And as she has gotten older, we have tried to teach her about about the holidays, about what they mean. And so we've taught her about, you know, what her birthday means, which is a celebration of her, and we have cake and we have presents. And she gets so excited about her birthday in August. And then we've taught her a little bit about what Christmas means, which is Jesus' birthday. And we've talked to her about St. Nicholas. So for Valentine's Day this year, we decided to help teach the holiday uh, by calling it, um, well, by calling it a day about giving and receiving love, or calling it Love Day. Sydney was really confused uh, when we made Valentine's Day um, kind of Valentine's and Valentine's Day fruit snack uh, Valentine's for all her friends at First Steps, Um, but we didn't make one for her. And she was really sad about it. She got a little bit upset. But we tried to help her understand that she was going to be giving away 
her own valentines to show her love and, and that her friends will be getting her valentines to show theirs. The Valentine's Day, especially for children, is a day to say, I love you. But it's also a day to say, thank you. We give love and we receive love. And it's most basic. That is what worship to God is all about. It is about a response to God where we say both thank you and I love you. Hamilton uses a story in his book about his granddaughter to illustrate this point. And he reminds us that expressing gratitude in thanksgiving and adoration in love is the essence of both worship and prayer. Now, if you're taking notes today, I want to invite you to to write that down. Expressing gratitude in thanksgiving and adoration in love is the essence of both worship and prayer. This type of worship is present throughout Scripture and it's practiced by Jesus often, and it's something that is foundational to our Christian spiritual life. This is because our souls need worship. And you were created for worship. Hamilton reminds us that it isn't just something that we observe or that we watch, but worship is something that we do. And it is part of who we are as God's created humanity. We have a desire to worship just as birds sing and trees grow and the earth spins. This desire or longing is innately present within each of us and and what goes with it is the choice each of us has before us every day. That is, to worship and glorify God with our lives or not. Whenever you receive a gift from someone or, or someone does something for you as a favor or a service, it is always good to say thank you. It is equally important, I think, to let those around us who are our children or our grandparents or parents or close friends, to let them know that we love them. If this is important, Hamilton says, then how much more important Is it to express this to the source of everything that exists? Who designed all that is, who sustains it by His power, and from whom, in an ultimate sense, all blessings flow? I think this is a fair question that Hamilton raises, and I hope it makes you pause as you listen and watch today. Worship, at its very essence, is our response to God, our Creator, and Redeemer, who is worthy of our focus and love and reverence and awe and thanksgiving and praise. This is what we are made for. And when we don't do this, or we avoid it, then we aren't living up to what God created us for. That is why Hamilton, in this first chapter of of this book, talks about each of us embodying the concept of being a living hallelujah. In our Intentional praise and gratitude and reverence and worship and showing our love for God as we sing or pray, we recognize that God is God and we are not. This recognition of our Creator and Savior allows us to find true communion with God and the grace and strength and love to live as His people in the world. To be a living hallelujah or an embodied act of worship ourselves. Well, some of you may be asking yourselves, well, that sounds great, but how do I do this? I've sat through worship before, um, and this doesn't feel very real to me. What does this look like in the real world? Or, Or maybe a scriptural example. Well, that's why Psalm 95 is offered up for us this morning as a a scriptural focus. Now, if you haven't already, I want to invite you to open up your Bibles to Psalm 95 and check out the first seven verses of this text, which is what Jenny read earlier. Um, This psalm gives us two clear paths for our own expressions of worship in the world. The first is worship together in a church community. And the second is worship in the form of individual prayer. Now, I want to invite you to to check out verse 1, verse 1 and 2. It says, O come, let us sing to the Lord, let us 
make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into the presence, into His presence, or, or God's presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to Him with songs of praise. Those two verses take me back to pre-pandemic, to when we could sing and worship together in this space and also in the other sanctuary. It reminds me of of Easter, singing um, Joy to the World, and it reminds me of of Christmas. It reminds me of being able to sing hymns together uh, and being able to worship together, sharing in that time. If you look between verses 3 and 5, the psalmist shifts the narrative to remind us as the reader and the worshiper who God is. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In His hand are the depths of the earth, the heights of the mountains are His also. The sea is His, for He made it, and the dry land which His hands have formed. It's a reminder of who the source of all of life is, and that is is God. Worship as a gathered act of praise and thanksgiving and recognition for who God is and who we are. That's what these first five verses of this psalm present to us. There is something about worshiping together through listening to the Word, praying with and for one another, praising and confessing, breaking bread and singing together that our souls need. The Holy Spirit can work in and through this kind of worship in a way that isn't experienced in other contexts. That is why Jesus asserts in Matthew 18 that where there are two or three gathered in my name, I'm there with them. Hamilton raises an interesting point in his book, though, about this aspect of worship, this community worship. He says that in order for it to be done as God intends... Community worship should be done in an engaged way. And I want you to write that word down if you've got a pad or a pen or take note of it. Worship should be done in an engaged way. This is for in-person worship, but it is also for online worship. It means setting aside time and space to prepare one's heart and mind for worship. It means praying ahead of time, taking notes, And sharing in those prayers and songs with with us who are leading worship. It means worshiping with a friend on YouTube or on a watch party and then calling each other later to talk about the sermon and the scripture which we discuss. It means praying together and praising together. Those of us who lead worship aren't doing it to be entertainment. We are offering ourselves to God to lead you in authentic worship, seeking to bless God and to be used by God to draw all of us to worship our Savior. Worshiping together as a people, whether in person or remotely, is an essential part of growing closer to God week by week. But verses 6 through 7 in our psalm allude to another form of worship that is individual daily prayer. Verse 6 says, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For Yahweh is our God, and we are the present, or the, we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would listen to his voice. Oh, that today you would listen to God's voice. These verses remind me of the importance of taking a daily moment to be in humble devotion and prayer and even silence before God. We have talked in the last several weeks of Jesus' own practices of withdrawing to be alone with God in prayer and how how that practice helped his, His ministry of teaching and healing. In response to seeing Jesus having an intentional prayer practice or prayer life to recharge His spiritual batteries, if you will, his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray. And Jesus responds by teaching them the Lord's Prayer. There are also moments in the Gospels uh, where Jesus talks about how one should pray and where one should pray. And later on in 
Paul, um, the Apostle Paul teaches his followers to rejoice always and to pray without ceasing. What is one way that we can make all this come alive in our own lives? So that we could deepen our love for God and become a living hallelujah, as Hamilton says. Well, Hamilton offers a couple of, uh, a couple of examples for how we could do this. And he uses something that's right in front of most of us, uh, our hands. Um, he incur- or invites us to um, use our left hand to remind us of uh, how often we could try to pray each day. Using our thumb to um, remind us to pray in the mornings when we, when we wake up. Me- greeting God whenever we, we wake up to a new day. And using the next three fingers... Um, to represent our meals for the day and giving thanks for those. So, giving thanks over breakfast and lunch and dinner. Pausing throughout our day to remember God and God's presence. And then, he talks about the pinky being a reminder to end the day with God. To think about our day, who we've talked to, what we've said, how we've acted. To make an examination of our hearts and ourselves. To end the day with God. Bookending your day with God, beginning and ending and giving thanks to God at mealtimes is, is a way to, for us to, um, to remember God throughout our day. The second, um, the, the second example that he uses is, is he gives us a guide with our right hands to talk about how to pray by using our fingers. He talks about how you can use your thumb if you're going to pray or offer a prayer to God, to begin with praise. Use a psalm or some other prayer to offer praise to God and and God's love. And then using our pointer finger to express thanksgiving. To express giving thanks and gratitude to God for some blessing. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, maybe I've had a bad day. Maybe I don't have anything to be thankful for. There's always something to be thankful for. And you can remind yourself, well, you can think, did I drink water today? That may be one basic thing that you could give thanks to God for in your life. Even if your day has been really rough, you can thank God for that. Second, or third, I mean, um, He guides us in in our third finger we use for confession. That is that moment where we um, express how we may have missed the mark Uh, in our day, then offering a prayer for forgiveness. Our ring finger is to ask for God's help and blessing for others or ourselves. It's it's the the moment where we remember petition. So we talked about praise, we've talked about thanksgiving, confession, and petition. And for our pinky finger, um, Hamilton lifts up something that's really unique, which he calls yielding. It is an offering of myself or or yourself to God and inviting God to use you in mission in the world. That fifth finger can be a really important one for us to begin our day with, yielding to God and letting our day be God's instead of for ourselves. This path of prayer gives us a broad outline for what might be included in your own conversations with God. If you're like me, there may have been moments in your life when you have begun praying and thought, well, where do I go next? Um, Well, God, what should we talk about right now? I want to invite you to try out this path of prayer. If this has been true for you at any time, then use it to bookend bookend your day, to begin your day and to end your day with this path. Worship is what we are made for. And God desires for us to be in communion with the great I Am. That is the source of all life and love and reconciliation. It is in our very nature to glorify God as a community of faith and individually in our hearts. As we begin our Lenten journey together, inspired by the Holy Spirit, let us find ways to worship together and on our own so that our steps begin to fall more and more in line with Christ, so that 
that then we can find ourselves walking even closer to God than we could have ever imagined. May this, or may that, be the gift of this Lenten season for each of us. Now, let us pray together. Lord, help us to see the beauty of this world You've given to us. Help us to notice the blessings all around us. Help us to remember that You are God and we are not. Help us to trust that somehow You will see us through even the painful things in life and bring good from them. Grant us a grateful heart. Finally, continue to inspire us to be a living hallelujah. In Jesus' name, amen.